Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank uh, Let me take a moment to pose myself here. It's uh, been a very heavy morning with great joy, deep concern, and everything in between. And I think, uh, in some strange, macabre way, uh, very appropriate to celebrate a 10-year pastoral anniversary with my mind on a deep pastoral need in our congregation. Because, brothers and sisters, that's what we're all about as God's people. We, we are about supporting one another. We are about strengthening one another, we are about bearing the message of Jesus to one another in the larger world. And I thank you for the privilege of doing that together with you over these past ten years. And uh, pray God's leading for us uh, in the time ahead. Thank you. Let's pray. Merciful God, we feel your presence among us this morning. We feel your presence in the words that we share. We feel that your presence in the music played. We feel your presence even as we pray, tending to the joys and concerns that we have lifted before you. Now, Lord God, we evoke that presence as we come to the Word of God, as we come to the Scriptures and to our study together. Help us once more, O oh God, to delve deeply into the core of our faith, to be built up by your mercy and love, and to be equipped to follow Jesus with all that we have. These things we pray through our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. For all of the times in our lives when there is more that meets the eye, when we have to read between the lines and parse out the motivations of those around us, every now and then, every once in a blue moon, we are blessed with an interaction that can be taken completely at face value. That is to say that occasionally, we encounter a question or a conversation that springs from genuine curiosity and desire for growth and learning. Nothing more and nothing less. And as challenging as this is for us, brothers and sisters, to have conversations and interactions where mixed motivations are all over them, I suspect that that was even more challenging for our Lord and Savior. For while we have some conversations that are marred by mixed motivations, if we look at the New Testament in detail, most of Jesus' conversations, particularly the ones with other religious leaders, were not simple or straightforward. While there might have been some genuine desire for learning and growth, that desire was almost always overwhelmed by rivalry and the struggle for power and authority that had existed between Jesus and his fellow religious leaders since he began to gain a following in Galilee. And so most of the questions that fellow teachers asked Jesus whether they be scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, unaffiliated, or curious, had some ulterior motive. Most often that ulterior motive was to in some way, shape, or form expose Jesus as being less than genuine, or get him in trouble with other religious or political leaders. By the time that today's scripture passage takes place, Jesus had been in public ministry for several years and is in the middle of the final confrontation 
with the religious and political leaders that will end up with him nailed to a cross. Several days earlier, he has entered Jerusalem to the acclaim of the crowds and cleared out the money changers from the temple. And from that point on, the religious leaders were looking for a way to silence him, a way to get rid of him, preferably permanently. Immediately before the passage that we read today, two other questioners asked Jesus underhanded and entrapping questions. First, some Pharisees and Herodians came to Jesus in the temple court and asked him whether it was lawful, that is to say, in keeping with Jewish religious teachings, to pay taxes to the pagan emperor. Now, theoretically, this is a yes or a no question, a true dilemma, if you will. But the trap of this question is that each potential answer that Jesus could give would land him in hot water with someone. Answering yes will loosen some of Jesus' influence on the crowds, crowds who are looking for a Savior who will deliver them from the Romans. Answering no will set Jesus up as a revolutionary and lead him into direct conflict with the Roman government at a time when Pilate is in Jerusalem with his entire cohort of troops. Jesus, sensing the trap, skillfully dodges the question by taking the denarius, the Roman coin, and asking whose name and image is on that coin, and then saying, well, if it's Caesar's image, it's on the coin, give to him what's his, and give to God what is God's. And after Jesus embarrasses the Pharisees and the Herodians, some Sadducees, not learning from others' experience, try their hand at entrapping Jesus. They make up a convoluted story about a woman who was married to seven brothers in succession, producing children with none of them, and finally ask Jesus, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Of course, the Sadducees do not publicly remind everyone that their question is absurd on, his fa on its face because they are asking Jesus about a resurrection that they do not believe in. But while the Sadducees may not say as much, Mark is not so nice to them. Mark reminds the reader right up front as soon as he says that the people who approach Jesus are Sadducees, that they do not believe in the resurrection the way we do. Mark doesn't go on to elaborate that the Sadducees believe that a man's name lives on through his children and his progeny. But Jesus cuts right through the Sadducees in trapping and absurd question as well, telling them that they are wrong because they know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus then goes on to explain that in the resurrection we neither marry nor are given in marriage, and that God is not a God of the dead, but rather of the living. If we thought the Pharisees and the Herodians were embarrassed by Jesus' answer, I can only imagine that the Sadducees wanted to find some hole to crawl into to get away from the cross looks they must have been getting from the crowds. I point out these two loaded questions that Jesus has just dealt with. Because it must have been rather difficult for Jesus to immediately pivot to a genuine and forthright question. The type of question that any sister or brother who hears the call to leadership among God's people, whether that call is a call to teach a Sunday school class, to pastor a church, or to lead at a higher level, must certainly live for. The type of genuine and deep spiritual question that any of us who call ourselves teachers and leaders of God's people love and enjoy. Mark tells us that a scribe came near. 
And hearing that Jesus answered well to the previous question, he's decided to ask one of his own. But before we dig too deeply into the scribe's question, there are several clues that this conversation will be different. This conversation is not one more of a series of entrapping questions, one more of a series of questions designed to get Jesus in trouble. The first clue is that Mark identifies this man by his office, not by his party affiliation. He might have been a Pharisee, he might have been a Sadducee, he might have not been affiliated with any of the major sects of Judaism at the time. But it becomes clear that this man is seeking wisdom and spiritual enrichment from his question. Because of the nature of the question, that he asks Jesus. You see, sisters and brothers, this scribe does not ask some thorny political question, although there is a time and a place for those types of questions. Nor does he get into some deep hypothetical that would have been so far outside of anyone's lived experience to have been Possible, but not likely. Instead, this scribe goes right to the core of their shared faith. The scribe asks Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus quickly understands that the scribe is not asking about chronological order, but rather about importance. Which commandment is the most important. Which commandment is at the core of our shared faith? This is not an academic question. This is not a question that is so easy to answer that it becomes worthless or immaterial. Beyond Christianity and Judaism, I dare say that every faith, every religion has struggled to define what are the core essential convictions of that particular religion or faith tradition? What is essential to believe or to do? So essential that if you cannot believe or do those things, you cannot be an inherent adherent of that particular religion. What is so foundational that everything else is built upon that core? The scribe is asking Jesus about first principles and core convictions. What is the most important commandment of our faith? Jesus answers his question by quoting directly from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, saying, The first is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then Jesus continues going beyond the parameters of the scribe's question by saying that there is a second, slightly less important, but still foundational to their shared faith. And quotes from Leviticus 19.19, calling us to love our neighbors as ourselves. The scribe quickly agrees with Jesus' assessment, adding his own affirmation that these two commandments were more important than all of the sacrifices and burnt offerings, than all of the ritual and worship traditions of the Jewish faith. Dare I say that for us as Christians, these two commandments are more important than all of the church services, all of the deeds of service, all of the time spent in prayer. For without these two, 
without loving God and loving our neighbors, we are not truly following Jesus. But even if we agree with Jesus in this scribe's assessment, and I believe that we ought to, for Jesus is the Lord of the universe, what is it about these two commandments that make them stick out from the other 611 commandments of Torah. Why are these two the most essential to our faith? Unfortunately for us, Mark is singularly unhelpful in this question of why, for neither Jesus nor the scribe offers us a reason for their shared assessment. But I suspect that in addition to coming to a similar conclusion, the two of them also had similar logic to get there. I believe that the reason that Jesus and the scribe elevate these two commandments, the commandment to love God and to love our neighbor, is because these two commandments share two very important characteristics. The first characteristic that they share is that they begin with our motivations. In naming the importance of loving God and loving neighbor, we are challenged to understand why we do the things that we do. Why do we come to church? Why do we offer prayers to God? Why do we offer worship? Why do we do these acts of service that God calls us to be about? Why are we the way that we are? Brothers and sisters, we are the way that we are because God is who God is. We do the things that we do because God first loved us, because God first sent Jesus to us, because God first demonstrated His love for us. In the great story of Scripture, there are two demonstrations of God's love that stick out above all the others, and there are countless more demonstrations of God's love. The first one chronologically that Moses so often evokes in the original giving of the law is that God demonstrated God's love by bringing the children of Israel up out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Before God demands one action in response of anyone, God first reaches out in love. Several other commandments show this when Moses uses phrases like, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. Or remember, you were a slave in Egypt. And secondly, God demonstrated God's love by sending Jesus to die for us. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 5 that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, before we had taken one single solitary step in God's direction, God so loved the world that He sent Jesus to redeem us. These phrases emphasize that any action of faith and faithfulness that we take any response of love that we offer to God comes because God first loved us. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength because God loved us with all He had and sent His Son Jesus to redeem us. Before God gave the Israelites laws to obey, He gave them deliverance from Pharaoh's taskmasters. And before God demanded that we follow Jesus, He freed us from sin and bondage. We love God and we love our neighbors plainly and simply because God first loved us. And the second characteristic that these two commandments emphasize that I believe is part of why Jesus and the scribe elevated these two, is that these two commandments emphasize the importance 
of an act of faith. The command to love God with all that we have and to love our neighbor as ourselves is not about how we feel about God or our neighbors. These commandments are about what we do towards God and towards our neighbors. In placing them together, a placement that goes beyond the scribe's original question, Jesus is reminding us that we cannot love the God whom we do not see if we do not love the fellow human beings whom we do see. Every action that we take in faith has its origin in this love. But like Jesus' brother, the Apostle James says, without actions, without deeds of love to go along with them, our words of love are suspect. The whole rest of the law, everything else that God demands of us, the rest of the example and teachings of Jesus are all summarized in these two commandments. For I believe if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all of our strength, and if we love our neighbors as ourselves, everything else will fall into place. As the conversation ends, Jesus speaks what is perhaps the most encouraging and affirming words that he gives towards a scribe, a Pharisee, or a Sadducee in the entirety of his earthly ministry. He tells the scribe that he is not far from the kingdom of God. This affirmation almost begs a question of the reader. How far are we from the kingdom of God? Does our love for God lead us to put God first? Loving Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all of our strength? Or are there others? Other commitments? Other ideas? Other people? Other demands that we put in front of God? Does our love for God lead us to seek our neighbor's good? Even when our neighbors are not particularly likable, not particularly nearby, or when we would prefer to seek the lowest common denominator of looking out for number one. The measure of the scribe's response to Jesus and the measure of our response to our Lord and Savior are not found in saying the right words. They're not found in the correct academic answers to these questions. The measure of our response is found in our living out our faith, in our keeping of these two commandments, in our loving God with all that we have, and in our loving our neighbors as ourselves. For brothers and sisters, if we do these things, if we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and if we love our neighbor as ourselves, then I believe that we can say with confidence that Jesus' affirmation to the scribe is also his affirmation to us. We are not far from the kingdom of God. Amen.